exciting world of molecular biology. Today we're going to be talking about gene cloning. Gene cloning is such a fundamental technique to molecular biology. It's the way that we can get genes into a form that we can use. So to put it simply, we've all heard about cloning animals where the offspring is a genetic copy of its parent. But when we talk about gene cloning, we mean to get multiple copies of a particular piece of DNA and get them in a form that we can actually use in our research. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to cure cancer. So some of the things that we study are, are how proteins within the cell cause the cell to either proliferate, to stay senescent, or to turn into other cells. And when those cells, those processes go wrong, that's what causes cancer. Each day we learn something new about infections of the central nervous system, the way in which the molecules that are generated in response to that infection can cause disease in the central nervous system. The ultimate goal of our research is to understand how genes are regulated. If we can understand how genes are regulated, that will put uh, others in a position to use that information to develop treatments for diseases. To clone a gene, we get the DNA that we're interested in, amplify it, and insert it into a cloning vector, such as a plasmid. The plasmid vector contains the extra sequences needed for the gene to eventually be used in research. The resulting recombinant vector is then replicated in a bacterial cell. We then isolate the recombinant DNA, screen it for our cloned DNA, and it's ready to use. To simplify our expression of gene cloning today, let's use the example of cloning the insulin gene so that we could produce the insulin protein. Insulin was the first gene cloned to produce a protein in commercial quantities. Millions of people with diabetes now take cloned human insulin produced by bacteria or yeast. To clone the DNA that we're interested in, in this case the insulin gene, obviously first we need to get some of its DNA. It'd be great if we could just get that from the cell. But because eukaryotic genes like insulin have introns, we can't just extract the DNA. Instead, we extract the cell's mRNA, which has already had the introns removed during transcription. Because we need a DNA version of our gene, we'll use the enzyme reverse transcriptase to make what is called complementary DNA, cDNA, from the RNA. And then we'll make it double-stranded using a DNA polymerase. So after all that hard work, we finally got cDNA copies of all the genes that are expressed in the cell. What we need to do next is copy just the gene that we're interested in. And to do that, we commonly use the incredibly powerful technique called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. In PCR, that cDNA that we've just generated will be used as a template from which we'll copy just the gene that we're interested in. In this case, the insulin gene. To prepare the reaction, we take a sample of the cDNA template that we made earlier. We then take a sample of each of the two primers that are designed to only anneal to either side of our insulin gene. Each primer is complementary to each of the different strands of the double-stranded DNA. We take a sample of some nucleotides, We'll add the all-important DNA polymerase. The polymerase enzyme extends the primer with nucleotides to copy the DNA template. A quick mix and let the thermocycler do the work. This machine changes temperature according to a program I've entered. To start the process, the DNA template is made single-stranded by heating to 95 degrees Celsius. The temperature is lowered to about 60 degrees Celsius to allow the primers to anneal. The temperature is then raised to 72 degrees Celsius, the optimal temperature for this type of polymerase, which adds nucleotides to the three prime end of the primer. DNA polymerases can only extend from an existing piece of DNA, and it copies the template until both strands are replicated. Because we want loads of copies, we're going to repeat that cycle 30 or 40 times. With each cycle, we double the amount of DNA. In the second cycle, 2 becomes 4. In the third cycle, 4 becomes 8. And in the fourth cycle, 8 becomes 16. Each copy is a new template for the next cycle, so there's an exponential increase. Mm -hmm. 
Now the repeated cycles are finished, PCR has amplified just the gene that we're interested in. In this case, the insulin gene. And now that we've got multiple copies of our gene, we need to insert it into a plasmid, which contains all the regulatory sequences that will allow it to be used. And we're going to do this in rather an elegant way. We cut both the plasmid and either end of our insulin gene with restriction enzymes, and they'll generate the sticky ends that can be used to glue the pieces together. Restriction enzymes recognise specific short DNA sequences called restriction sites and cut the DNA there. This process is called digestion. Restriction enzymes are naturally used by bacteria to cut up any invading DNA. But we're going to hijack them and use them for science. To start the process, I have to prepare two tubes of restriction enzyme and buffer. I take a sample of some plasmid and I add it to the first tube. Plasmids were also originally found in bacteria and are small replicating circles of DNA that have been engineered to contain a number of different restriction sites inside what is called a multiple cloning site. I then take a sample of the insulin gene that we generated earlier and add it to the second tube. The restriction sites at either end of the insulin gene were added as part of the PCR process. When we designed the primers to amplify the gene, we simply added the restriction site to the five prime end of each primer. And now, we just leave the restriction enzyme to do its stuff, generating our sticky ends. When the enzyme cuts both the plasmid and the insulin gene, it leaves overhanging single-stranded ends, which can stick to a complementary sequence. So now each tube contains the bits that we want, as well as the bits we don't want, like the bits that have been cut away from the end of the gene. And we need to separate them. And the way we do that is using gel electrophoresis. So let's go and do it. Gel electrophoresis is one of the most useful means of separating DNA fragments. Running DNA through an agarose gel under an electric current separates DNA by size. The phosphate in DNA is negatively charged, so DNA will run towards the positive pole. So first, we've got to make a gel. We just pour melted agarose into a gel caster, we add a well comb to make the wells, and then we leave it to set. Once our gel is set, we just put it into the gel tank. The tank contains a buffer solution which is hooked up to positive and negative electrodes. After we take out the well combs, each sample is mixed with a loading die. We then load our plasmid sample and insert sample into two different wells of the gel. We also load a standard ladder containing DNA fragments of known sizes. And then finally apply the electric field. The smallest fragments run the fastest as they present less drag through the agarose. Once the blue dye reaches the bottom of the gel, the DNA fragments have separated according to size. We can then go and visualise these fragments under UV light. I then simply cut out the purified plasmid and the purified gene insert. Now we've cut our fragments out of the gel, we just need to melt the pieces. Now that they've melted, we just need to mix the digested plasmid and insert together. Now our insert and plasmid join together via base pairing between the compatible overhanging ends. But that's a relatively weak force. We need to make a strong phosphodiester bond. And that's catalyzed by this enzyme, ligase. And now we just leave the reaction overnight and let ligase do its thing. Now that we've incubated this overnight, our ligation should contain some plasmid molecules 
with the insert in it. In this case, the insulin gene. But we're also going to have some plasma that hasn't been able to ligate successfully. And we need a way to sort out those bad guys from the good guys. Well, we'll use bacteria. Each bacterial cell will take up one plasmid molecule from our ligation mixture and replicate it so that we can analyse each one separately for the presence of the insert. The process is called transformation and it's pretty simple. We just mix the DNA, in this case our ligation mix, with some bacteria that have been made permeable. Then we're going to apply a short blast of heat just to shock the bacteria into taking up the DNA. We then create a sterile field and take a sample of some nutrient media to add to the mix. Nutrient media provides all of the essential nutrients for bacterial growth. This growth allows the antibiotic resistance gene to be expressed. So I'll just go put this on the shaker. Plasmids contain an antibiotic resistance gene and a replication origin. As the bacteria grow, the plasmid replication origin duplicates the plasmid independently of the bacterial chromosome in the host cell. And as the plasmid replicates, the antibiotic resistance gene is expressed. Now the plasmid has had a chance to express its antibiotic resistance gene, I can spread the bacteria out onto a solid nutrient media containing antibiotics. Then I'll just take this plate to the incubator and let the bacteria grow overnight. At 37 degrees Celsius, the cells grow and multiply. Plasmid replication is independent of the cell's division and the plasmids are distributed to each daughter cell as the host cell divides. The number of copies of the plasmid is greatly amplified, with each plasmid producing its own colony of identical cells. something's grown. And as it's the plasmid that contains the antibiotic resistance gene, only bacteria that contain the plasmid have grown overnight. So to check which of these colonies contain our plasmid with the insert, we're going to take each colony and grow it in culture overnight. So first, we need to set up some tubes of nutrient media with antibiotics. And then to each tube, I'm going to add a single colony. So, now each tube contains a single colony. I'll just take them to the incubator and let them grow overnight. So each of these bacterial cultures has grown from a single bacterial cell, each one containing a plasmid from our ligation mix. So we'll go and extract the plasmid so that we can check which ones contain the insert. To separate our plasmid from the other components of the cell, we'll rely on its unique solubility. First we need to separate the bacterial cells from the culture media. And we'll do that by centrifugation. To start, I transfer the culture to centrifuge tubes. And now we'll load them into the centrifuge. During this short low speed spin, the largest and densest materials sediment first, forming a pellet at the bottom of the tube. Here the pellet contains primarily unbroken cells, which are our bacterial cells. The culture media has then separated and remains as a supernatant. <laughs> 
Now our bacterial cells have formed a pellet, we can throw away the culture supernatant. We then resuspend each bacterial pellet in a consistent volume of buffer. And the next thing we need to do is break open the cells. And we do that using detergent at a high pH. The detergent breaks down the lipid cell wall to release the cell contents. And then we need to neutralise our solution. So we'll do that with a weak acid, like acetic acid. Neutralisation allows the plasmid to renature and become double-stranded and soluble once again. However, because the chromosomal DNA is so long, it can't renature. And then it's back in the centrifuge. Again, the material with the greatest size and density moves the fastest to the bottom of the tube. Denatured chromosomal DNA, membranes and protein sediment under these conditions, but the soluble component, such as the plasmid, do not. And so the plasmid remains in the supernatant. So now the soluble plasmid remains in solution and we'll transfer that into a new tube. And we can throw away the precipitate. And now we need to separate the plasmid from all the leftover chemicals, and we'll do that by adding ethanol. Nucleic acids are insoluble in ethanol, so the plasmid will precipitate when we centrifuge it again. Once the plasmid's precipitated, we can throw away the supernatant. And then, because ethanol can interfere with later steps, we'll just leave them to dry. Once the pellets are dry, we resuspend our purified plasmid in a small volume of buffer. So at last, we've got plasmid extracted from each one of our bacterial cultures. But we still don't know which of these plasmids actually contains our insert, in this case, our insulin gene. So we need to go and screen them. To screen each of the plasmids, one way is to set up a restriction digest. To do this, we simply cut each plasmid with the same restriction enzyme that we used earlier. If the insert is present in the plasmid, it will be cut out to generate two fragments. But if the insert isn't present in the plasmid, only one fragment is generated. So I've set up a restriction digest for each of our plasmids that we extracted earlier. To visualise the DNA in our cut up plasmids and check whether we've got the insert, we need to run a gel. So, now that our fragments have separated, at last we can go and have a look which one of our plasmids actually contains the insert. Great! So, these samples here contain just the plasmid, but this sample here contains both the plasmid and the insert, and that's what we're looking for. So, by analysing our gel, we found that at least one of our plasmids actually contains the insert, and it's this one. Now that it's in a plasmid vector, it contains all the regulatory sequences that it needs, we can put it into cells and let the cells act like a factory to produce the insulin protein.
But producing a protein like insulin to use as a drug is not the only use for gene cloning. We use gene cloning to understand where and when in an organism a particular gene is expressed. The way we do this is we uh, take the promoter or the regulatory sequences of a particular gene and clone that into a plasmid. We then replace the gene itself with a different gene that is readily detectable, that is something like the green fluorescent protein. When we then introduce this plasmid into an animal, the cells that normally make the gene of interest will now glow green. We clone genes to try and find out about the structure of proteins and other molecules in the cell. When we use cloning, we actually clone the cDNA of the gene which encodes the protein. We put that into a protein expression vector uh, and use that in the cell in order to hijack the cell's protein production machinery and that allows us to make lots of protein. We use gene cloning to target the expression of specific cytokine genes to cells of the central nervous system. We use plasmid DNA vectors to incorporate the cytokine gene into a vector which is then added to the cell, allowing that cell then to produce that cytokine. We can then study the effects of the cytokine on the cell and if the cell is actually in the brain we can study the effects of that cytokine on the brain itself. I hope we've given you an appreciation of some of the broad applications of gene cloning. It's such a powerful tool and it's going to help science to solve some of the problems that are facing humanity. And as future scientists, that's up to you.